Hello and welcome to State of the Project Meros. This is the February edition 2021. I am your host, Cryptosi, and I am joined by none other than the enigmatic man himself, Kaiba. Kaiba, sir, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Excellent. Well, um, hot off the the heels of last week's um, monetary policy call. It feels like I'm with you every Saturday night now <laughs> during lockdown. For those who don't know, Meros is a new cryptocurrency which does what cryptocurrencies are supposed to do. It is feeless and it is as near instant as you can be. This podcast we've been on for two and a half years, so I don't feel like explaining what it is today. We're just going to jump straight into it. Got loads and loads of questions for you, Kaiba, so I hope you are ready. I am. Good. Let's right. do it. So, uh, question number one. Um, there was a, a, a commit or a, a pull request or a merge, maybe, to update the copyright year. Um it's a good opportunity to ask you about copyright. I know it's a it's a subject that we've spoken about a lot off air. Um, what are your feelings towards copyright? And in particular, how do you feel about um, projects that will fork Meros in the future, as it already has 74 stars, which means people are looking to copy this thing and, um, yeah, stand on, stand on the shoulders of giants. Giants meaning Kaiba. So... Just to start updating the copyright year, that's just completely standard. 2021, new year, you know, update the copyright, signify, yes, this is a project under active development, and that the copyright still applies. So as for, I think really what the next discussion comes to when we talk about copyright is it comes to licensing. When we look at open source projects, we look at uh, open source licenses, such as the MIT license, the GPL license, the LGPL and uh, also some others such as the BSD license and so on, or generally BSD3. There's a couple of BSD licenses floating around. So Meros is under the MIT license, which is personally my favorite. It's not completely open. It's not public domain code, but it basically says anyone can use this code for whatever. They just can't hold anyone who developed it liable. You know, we're not offering a warranty. We're not promising it won't break anything or cause any damage if you use it to run a financial system and then for some reason the code breaks. <laughs> we're not responsible for that. We tried our best, okay? We wrote the test. If you take it and edit it, we're not responsible. <laughs> uh, but it also says um, that if you do edit it, you just have to maintain our copyright. You have to say, oh yeah, these people developed it from X day to Y day. So yeah, um, Sorry, just running through my head. Uh, so there are a couple other licenses out there, such as the GPL, uh, another popular one, uh, which is notably used for Linux. I mean, it's very widespread, don't get me wrong. Just Linux is probably the biggest project I know of using it, because uh, Linux is Linux. Um, but how, but do you, how do you feel about people forking it? That's really like the some projects do get upset. I've met some developers who get really upset when people fork their open source code that they've previously forked from someone else. So how do you feel? I was that? trying to get to that because the GPL license is notable because if you want to fork our project, you literally just have to include our names. You have to say, yes, these people developed it from years X to Y. And if you continue up uh, integrating their updates, you also have to acknowledge that. The GPL license goes a very different route in that you have to preserve that license. So right now, you could take Meros, and you could close source it, actually. You could say, yes, when you ship out binaries, that it is based on Meros, and that is copyright. Uh, currently, the copyright's assigned to be uh, Luke. And when you do that, that's just a requirement. But you can make alterations to Meros and do whatever you want with them and sell them however you want. And if I applied the GPL license instead, no companies would be able to create closed source alterations to Meros. They would have to make sure it's also GPL. Uh, which would create a more open ecosystem, but limit the potential because it means that any company that wants to use Meros must be willing to open source it, which stops enterprise adoption and so on. Not that that's what we're seeking per se. So I, my point here was, and the reason I tried to explain the GPL license 
is Ion purposely chose a very open license. So Marrows can be used by whoever, whenever, wherever, however they want. I think forking coins is a fact of nature. And if I wanted to stop works, I would get some bullshit patents and close source the project and be a total jerk. I actually do know a couple of projects um, which didn't release source, or when they did release source, used a very, very heavy license. Uh, for like as I was saying, the GPL it requires that all uh, edits to it must also be made open source. That's not even as heavy as some of the licenses I've seen. I've seen licenses that say uh, it's open source, but no one else can create alterations. Like it all must go through our GitHub. Uh, Bitcoin Cash. It, it might be Bitcoin SV. It might not be Bitcoin Cash. It might be Bitcoin SV. But one of the two of them has a license that says this software can only be used with a Bitcoin blockchain with a block hash that matches the Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV fork. But there are projects that try to lock it down to a certain organization or to a certain uh, active database. And I really, really detest those projects. Um, it, it's not open. It, if you are worried about competition, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be better. You're supposed to say, yes, competition exists, but you know we're around for a reason, we're respected for a reason, and so on. And with a lot of these projects, that's legacy. If we look at Bitcoin, it's the number one cryptocurrency. Technically speaking, while it may have the number one development team, I'm not trying to say otherwise, its functionality does not nearly match other functionality in other coins. And because of that, the reason it's so significant is just because it has the legacy. It was there first, it's heavily respected, it has the team it does, and it's been around for over a decade now. So I completely understand that, but the reason I picked such an open license is truly because I welcome forks. I welcome other people to contribute to the ecosystem. And I don't plan on liking the forks. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be an ass about it, but I'm not going to be saying, oh, they forked Marrows. They must be good people with a song in their heart who just want to help out. <laughs> no, I imagine plenty of people are going to fork Marrows for a quick buck. Uh, some of them are going to add functionality I disagree with, whether it be uh, a different consensus mechanism that's more centralized, you know, leaning towards uh, DPoS instead of POS, or where POS means proof of stake, of course, or... Uh, privacy, and I just disagree with the privacy they're using, you know. There's definitely a lot of things that can happen here. And that's something I accept because I'm one in open ecosystem, and I encourage competition because not only does it keep me on my toes, but if they also open source their work, that means projects can benefit from each other. I, speaking of that, I mean, we've already uh, created ASMR, or Atomic Saw Project, based on Monero Research, and that was actually the first code base to implement it. And it didn't just implement it for Meros, it actually implemented it for Monero and Nano. I'm a big fan of collaboration and working together, so. Yes, that's good, that's good. Um, I remember um, some podcast we had done years ago, probably now, and you had said that you could fork Meros with, with a few lines. It's very, very easy to do. Is that uh, still the case or has development taken you down a slightly different road? So I do know that uh, there's a couple of definitions here. If we're skipping the tests, like any good fork developer does, who cares about tests? <laughs> no, who needs tests, to verify their work? Tests are pointless. Um, what we need is a quick ICO, get the money in, you know, that's what we do. So I obviously don't believe that, but I do know a lot of Bitcoin tests, uh, uh, Bitcoin forks don't maintain tests for their work. And not only do they not maintain existing tests, you know, if they add functionality, they're like, yeah, it's probably fine. You know, we send a human at it for five minutes. Um, and Mero is one of the things I prided on. It, is, it has two very comprehensive test suite. One being in DIM, the language Meros itself is written in, which tests isolated parts of the code base. And one being in Python, which effectively re-implements the entire protocol. Uh, it isn't a node. It doesn't do enough validation. You know, it can't get sent a block and check it's valid, but it can properly serialize and manage blocks. Um, so if you're not counting about the test, I try to keep it, I, I tried to keep it down to two files, a uh, configuration file, which sets some flags at compile time. Uh, one of the things Marrows does is before it creates a signature, it prefixes Marrows to it in all caps. So if anyone else is using this private key elsewhere, uh, the signatures won't uh, coincide. So if you fork Meros, uh, a signature made on one network won't work on the other as long as you also update the signature separation we have. 
Uh, but beyond that, that all gets routed through a single config file. Like it's defined in our actual signing code, but you can override it from an external configuration file. So that external config controls most stuff. Beyond that signature, I think the one thing that doesn't, like I think the one thing that doesn't outsource to that configuration file is the actual chain parameters uh, for the mainnet and testnet. So I think because of that, you would have to edit the config file I'm discussing and the main chain params file. But I think if you edit those two files, that would be it. Okay, nice and easy then. Yep. Nice and easy. Good. I'm glad to glad to hear that you're you stuck with that. Um, well, it then... wasn't necessarily to keep forks open. It was really just to maintain a clean code base. If someone wants to take Maros and add an ICO to it for $1,000, $10,000, however much they think they can get out of it, they're going to do it. There's not going to be a way to stop them. Sure, I can make the code hell, but what that's really going to do is just make my own life hell. <laughs> um, I remember when working on it, I had these variables just wherever they were needed. Like I would just define the constant at the top of the file and walk away. But then if I needed to edit them, I would have to jump to that file and work on it. And there was a level of difficulty uh, not necessarily with editing them, because I didn't do that too frequently, but looking them up in the first place to make sure I was thinking about the right values. Uh, so the reason I finally went and created that config file was just because I wanted to clean up the code base a bit. It was nice to have all the variables referred to in one single central place. And it's that reference to that uh, is what makes it easy to fork, but it also creates a clean code base that makes it easier to work with. So I just felt that, you know, fork developer, if they really want to, are going to fork it. And I would like to have a clean code base, not only for myself, but to make it more accessible to anyone else that wants to uh, work with Maros. Okay. That's a good answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. I'm going to jump into, I've got a few issues, a few commits, and uh, a few general topics, right? So I'm going to jump straight into one of the issues. And... Um, I like this one. I picked it out um, for two reasons. Number one, it said protocol, which always gets me excited. And number two, um, the the title was just three words. <laughs> it was really concise. It's just it's uh, issue number two seven four, and it just said significant isn't helpful. Um, I think it's kind of telling that you've you've published this one or you've added this one on December the twenty eighth. So you probably enjoying your Christmas and you decided, you know what, I don't need this kind of stress moving into a new year, so let's get this ironed out. So could you tell me a little bit about um, why Significant isn't helpful and uh, how you've actually <laughs> fixed this? Because it's, it's already been closed, but if you could just talk, talk us through. The reason I remember this one is because it was actually a part of a few different issues that I used rather emotional titles with. <laughs> like, um, I think I called another issue incompetent. <laughs> like, I was just like, this isn't helpful, this is incompetent, screw off. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure that's, uh, is that one of the questions I've got later on? No, I think I missed I, that I, one out. I do think I updated the title of one of okay. them in response. I think I was like, okay, I've been a bit emotional, uh, just calling it incompetent isn't helpful, let me update the title a bit. <laughs> I do think I worked on that. <laughs> but that's the reason I always find it notable. Uh, right, so we used to have this field in the header. Uh, it was called significant. And the idea of it was um, when we're staking blocks, we don't actually stake transactions, uh, something like Bitcoin would. Uh, instead, we stake references to verifications of transactions. Uh, and this is one of the ways in that um, transactions confirm outside of blocks because blocks don't actually have verifications. Uh, they have references to verifications. And it's this whole system. Um, so we're supposed to already have all these transactions and verifications. So sticking them again when we want to stick a block is really just, uh, sorry, is really just inefficient. Um, and in order to get rid of some of these inefficiencies, we use something called sketches. Uh, it's an algorithm called pin sketch, where the leading library for it is something called mini, uh, mini sketch. And I've talked, I've, Pretty sure I've explained it before. Yes. Let's say we have three items where it's the numbers one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And I can create a sketch of items one, two, and three. And I can set what's called a capacity of one. And if the capacity is one, that means that the size of the sketch is the size of a single item. So despite having three items in our sketch, only it's the size of a single one, therefore meaning it takes 33% of the size. Now, Cryptosi, if you only have one and two, you can look at my sketch compared to what you have and say, oh, I'm missing element number three. Great. 
Or if you have one and three, you can compare it and get number two. You can get any missing element as long as you have the rest. Uh, it's a really useful piece of technology uh, that we really use to shrink down the amount of data set in blocks because, again, you're already supposed to have all of it. Or, you know, not perfectly, but close enough that we can do such sketches. So there was a concern where if you flood the network with uh, transactions that... And it wasn't really with network flooding. It was just the idea that if the network has a lot of transactions going around, um, it might be best to mark some out in advance. Because the thing about pin sketch is it's symmetrical. If I have one, two, and three, but you have one, two, three, four, and so basically we have the same info, but if I create a sketch with the capacity of one for one, two, and three, and you take your sketch with the capacity of one for one, two, three, four, it's symmetrical, as if both of us will discover element number four. And you'll discover it and be like, oh, I already have that. I don't care. And I'll discover it. And, well, I wouldn't discover it. You didn't send it to me. I sent you the sketch. But my point is, is that you can fill it up with, like, random data. And that can cause er uh, problems resolving it. Because if either side has data that the other side doesn't have, it contributes to the capacity. And the second the capacity is exceeded, it just returns junk data. It's not usable at all. Um, not the best explanation I know, I'm sorry. So in order to reduce the amount of different data on both sides leading to a unresolved sketch, which then forces a full list of references, uh, what we did was is we included something called significant. And it's uh, and basically the idea behind the significant is if we include a transaction, it's going to have votes. Let's say that votes, those votes equal five merit. That means we set the significant to five merit, and if any transaction got less than five merited votes, we just didn't include it. We said it wasn't uh, significant enough to be included in the block. And this wasn't some commentary on filtering. It's not like we were going to filter out low, uh, transactions with low merit. It was just a comment on what's the least significant transaction we did actually include. And that's nice in theory, except the second anyone includes a single transaction, which got a single merit for voting, then the significant is sent to one which offers no additional data because everything with the verification will be included. So it was really just an inefficient system that tried to solve the problem, but didn't do it well. So significant was replaced with the amount of transactions. So now if you see that the block has 400 transactions in it and you have 200, you'll realize, okay, so I am missing at least 200 transactions. You know, I may have an extra few that they don't have. So I am going to request a sketch of 240. And that means even if I have 40 transactions, the other party doesn't have, you know, I'll still get my result. And that is still 240 out of 400. That is still um, 60%. You know, that's notable. But that's 40% less than the block originally would be. So there is a lot of benefit there. This next one, um, <laughs> I initially thought it was CL, but it's not. Um, this this is the incompetent one. Oh, actually. CI. Yeah. Yeah, CI. Yeah. So, um, CI is incompetent. <laughs> I, this, I guess this was the second one. I kind of was... feel bad. I'm like bullying my CI here. <laughs> I, when I was looking through these issues and I was saying, I was thinking, this guy's really. Oh, no, really I didn't annoyed. update the title. <laughs> I didn't update the title. I'm still no, bullying it. It's still there. It's still oh. bullying it. Um, this one's still open, by the way, as well. So, poor old CI is. Oh, yeah, there. no, it leaks to several other issues, some of them dating back months. Mm -hmm. right, this is okay. a long standing problem. So, this is issue number 282. Um, C CI is incompetent. Uh, mm -hmm. This is. this is You've got a nice. Uh, actual discussion here. No, you had no discussion on the other one. This one, <laughs> this one's quite concise actually. This one's quite to the point. But you've you you have put a, a post. You have put. A, uh, I'm going to put the link in the mm -hmm. in the uh, in the description for those of you who are are listening. And um, I think as always, next time. Yeah, I think what I may do next time is actually have a window where I share my screen and people can read along with us. Which, People might find fun. Oh, no, I'm not sure what other tabs you may have open. <laughs> you sure you want to show your well, I'll tell Pokemon you collection I'll off to the world? Oh, I'll, my God. I'll I tell wish you, you collected I've got, Pokemon. I've got Dogecoin on, on watch <laughs> at the moment, and that's about it. Okay, so so um, the issue, what you put here is that the issue is not for the fact the CI is currently disabled. 
or fail the test. So these must be the other things that you're No, those are separate issues. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. The CI is currently disabled. The issue uh, is about what the CI doesn't do beyond that. The CI never ran the Python tests. And then there's a sad, there's a, looks like a sad face. Or oh, is it an open bracket? I think it's an open bracket, to be fair. Oh, it those are parentheses. I, yeah. I didn't realize it was going to embed. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to embed at the time. Yeah. No, because it was weird. Because it was originally just a link that I had in parentheses. And then I remembered I could embed it. So I cr added the embed. Uh, okay. So it directly presented the relevant lines of code. But then I forgot to remove the parentheses that yes. said it was subtext. So it basically looks like there's a sad face and then it jumps into mirrors.nimble. But um, put me out of my misery. What is or who is CI and what have they done wrong? Okay, so <laughs> to be clear, CI is not a person. It stands for, uh, okay, if you watch crime shows, criminal informant, if you're a cop, confidential informant, or if you're a programmer, uh, I want to say continuous integration, but I could be wrong about that. <laughs> and it basically says every time I publish an update to the source code of Maros, uh, the surface known, uh, I think we're using GitHub, not Travis. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're using GitHub for this. Uh, but GitHub allows you to run tests on it whenever you publish it. So every time you publish the code, theoretically, it's supposed to compile Maros and run the test against it. Um, so if we look at so I like three issues here, uh, one of them, 165, was about the wallet database, is that we have a test which independently implements it, and it occasionally desyncs. And I remember centering a few days on this bug and not being able to figure it out. If there's some edge case, and I honestly don't know if the test is wrong or if the wallet database itself is wrong. Um, so that's something I've yet to go to. So that is one failing test that has been failing uh, Let's see, one second, let me check the data on this. I have my webcam clipped to the top of my laptop and it's actually blocking some of my screen. That one's been open since March, 2020, just because I spent a few days on it and then decided it was such an edge case, it wasn't really worth my time <laughs> because it wasn't actively affecting people. It was a- well, uh, This was going to be my follow on question. Does it, is it just a, <laughs> a, a, a something that kind of stumbles during the build process or is it something that people should be worried about? Uh, it, people should be worried about it if it hit Maros at mainnet. Right now, it's just when you send thousands of transactions in certain ways, eventually something happens. I still don't know what. I spent a few days on it, and I couldn't crack it at the time. Um, just because it's a lot of data to sift through. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not something I've ever had it actively trigger. And because of that, it's not something concerned about. But it is something that can't be hit into mainnet, especially where it is. It's with the... Um, it's with the wallet, which is, you know, obviously very critical. Uh, and then with this other issues, it's about the transactions test. Uh, and this is actually twofold. At one point, it mistracks spendable. Uh, spendable is what we use when we're trying to create a transaction. We know, we're like, hey, what transactions can we spend? Oh, we can spend X, Y, Z, great, thanks. And this actually doesn't... Um, this actually isn't consensus critical at all. I, it does affect the wallet, don't get me wrong, but it the consensus of it still works fine. This is uh, metadata to track. This isn't actually part of the uh, core protocol or reliant on it. Uh, the other thing we have with the transactions test is families don't reload properly. Families are a grouping of transactions according to consensus. It's a whole thing. That one may or may not be consensus critical. Um, I've only ever had it happen with transaction flooding. Uh, so again, like the wallet database, yes, it isn't critical if it made it into mainnet, but it's, I've never actually had it naturally occur and I still don't know why it occurs, but I actually haven't spent time on this one. I only reported it, uh, in the middle of December. Um, and I honestly think that may be an issue in testing methodology yeah. because when you reload them, they reload differently than they were originally crafted. And that's not invalid. That's completely valid behavior. Um, but when you reload them, you need to then do an equality check. So we have a custom equality check that says that they have the same meaning, even if they don't have the same literal value. And it's this. Uh, and I think that's where our problem lies, but I'm not entirely sure. Do you feel like you're So there are a couple of. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, do you feel like you're spending most of your time now just chasing down these smaller issues and and tidying them up 
Uh, I wouldn't say so. I've been putting them off and I'm still putting them off. Uh, there's still a couple of core protocol features we're working on, like the emission curve, which we recently had a call about to discuss and decide. Yeah, we will discuss um, that later. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm sure we will. Uh, yeah. I will spoil that too much. Um, but no, we also have to implement not only that, but things like the DAO. So basically, we have a couple of tests failing on technicalities. Uh, we have hundreds of tests. I'm not too concerned about the fact two of them are failing, and they're actually both more critical, just because none of them should fail in the first place. But when it comes to the CI being incompetent, it's that while it did run some of the tests, the ones in DIM, uh, it never actually ran the Python tests, which are the end-to-end -end ones, which test the complex consensus code instead of just uh, individual accuracy of components. And they're actually the ones I spend most of my time with nowadays, whereas uh, earlier in the past, I spent most of my time with the NIM tests just because, you know, I was still writing these individual components and, you know, I wasn't really concerned about how they link together. Because obviously I was, I'm just saying that wasn't where most of the bugs were. Um, so yeah, so that's why the CI is labeled incompetent just because it only runs a fraction of the test. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there was a security exploit found in GitHub Actions where you could basically hijack any pipeline. A uh, CI can also be used to produce uh, build files, which is why this is exceptionally dangerous because you could have a malicious actor falsely report tests were succeeding or failing, uh, or you could have them edit the build. So we're not using it to build files, to be clear. I'm just noting technically uh, CI in general can be used for that. So with GitHub Actions, an exploit was found in it and we use a certain dependency that uh, uses uh, the vulnerable area of code. So theoretically, I just have to update the dependency. I just have yet to test it out. Hence why that is still an open issue. Right. It's interesting you said that because I did actually assume as you was talking that you, you was using that to, to build the code. I think I, I said that in one of my follow-up questions. I want to move on though. Uh, this one, I, I wasn't really sure this one was an issue, but during the discussion, you hadn't said uh, that it should be moved to somewhere else. But it was one, um, I've moved on to community uh, questions now, because we have had quite a few, as the community seems to be exploding at the moment, uh, which makes sense as you move towards mainnet. Um, so this one was a uh, uh, issue number 281. Um, guidelines for contributing. And this is Bitcoin's for seal, Pedro. Um, a community member who I, I really, really <laughs> like his, his, um, his input that he puts in as it's um, it's usually quite um, quite thought through, as it's, it's obviously he's had quite a lot of experience within crypto himself. Um, I'm going to read out what he's put, and then I'll I guess I'll let you answer. But it's uh, it's something that we've touched on before, and now someone else is touching on it. And I guess it's a bit more um, more uh, more concentrated now because it's another it's another developer talking on it whereas i was kind of just saying okay well how do we get people involved how do you get people involved whereas this is kind of like well when they are involved how do they so basically this is what uh bitcoin's fossil has said um having firm guidelines on project management and getting involved is extremely valuable oh he's actually just quoted you and then that does sound like something kerber would say he's then linked to um the GitHub and the the actual contributing, I guess that's a folder, and he said, um, uh, it's a is, section on the roommate. Is it okay? Yes, okay, sorry, yes, it is going to the hashtag. Um, he's then said this is not enough, and um, he'll research on some good ones. Uh, what kinds of things is he feel or does he feel is missing? You have responded, but I'll let you respond here on the video. So basically. Sorry, I just had to stretch for a second. Uh, basically, we have a contributing section that just says, like, feel free to check out the issues in the source code, have fun, bye. Um, <laughs> which is not comprehensive. So when we're discussing encouraging contributions, we really need to make the process more friendly. We need to say what we're looking for, how things should be submitted, you know, how things operate, kind of not require you to be in the know and not have you randomly experiment and get told off, because that's also what happens if you, you know, just randomly experiment. You can try to create... I actually did that with the project back in the day, uh, years ago. I was like, oh, I want this functionality. I'll just create a PR for it. And then they're like, uh, no, this isn't how this works. You can't just like add functionality like that. And that was extremely legitimate of them. I'm not trying to shame them anymore. Wait, they're right. I can't just add functionality the way I did. Um, 
I guess because it theoretically wouldn't have broken anything, but it really does need to be a documentation and feature request project uh, process for that project. And I completely bypassed that just because I misunderstood it. So basically the commenta commentary is unique guidelines. You need to establish how to contribute, you know, how to efficiently contribute and so on. And one of the ways you can do that is just by adding issue templates to GitHub. When you create an issue on GitHub, you can automatically provide a template uh, and you can kind of coach users to do that. You're like reporting an issue, click here. And then it's like, okay, short summary of the issue. How did you trigger it? Do you know what version you're running? Like what OS are you on? And you can get a lot of the info uh, relevant and valuable just by having an issue template that clarifies what info you're looking for and what order you want it in. Uh, beyond that, one of the things we have is a style guide that says, you know, if you um, edit the code, just have follow this style. You know, we want our code to look similar. We don't want you to jump to another file and completely shift how you are thinking of reading it. And while that style guide is in existence, um, when it comes to our Python specifically, not for our NIM, there's no NIM test, for, NIM way to do this currently. But when it comes to our Python, we actually have a tool that automatically checks that the Python is not only technically correct, but is correctly styled. So that's another thing we could use for our CI. So if anyone tried to create a PR and they miss some styling, this would just give them an automated heads up, like, hey, you might want to correct this. You're going to have to if you want to contribute. Um, and then the discussion got even more interesting based off an article uh, that Pedro sent that really covered the, va the value of reporting bugs in specific ways. And he also linked Monero's uh, contributions file, which is something called C4. And that is, that is not the explosive. I forget the full name of it. It's like community contribution something something. And it was actually developed a while ago by a project known as Zero MQ. And it has a lot of good points. Uh, it's very opinionated. And some of the opinions I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, but beyond that, we can't just grab it. Because uh, it requires projects be copy left. And copy left refers to licenses such as the GPL, which is something we don't use and I explicitly do not like. Because the worst part about the GPL license requiring uh, further code, BGPL, like edits to it, is that random X, the hash algorithm we use, which is CPU only, it's been used by Monero, it's widely renowned at this point, it was originally licensed as GPL. And that means that we could not use the hash algorithm itself unless Maris itself became GPL. We couldn't use a hash algorithm unless we completely changed our license to be way more restrictive because of the terms of the GPL and how integrating it into our project would count as alterations. They're not alterations, but it would count. Um, and for some reason, one of the opinions that the C4 has, this community guidelines, is that the project itself must use a copy left license. Not that all submissions must use the same license that, oh, I don't get it. I, I don't get why it has this opinion and requirement. It just seems outside of scope. I, I, I don't like it. So we, we unfortunately can't just use C4, but it does bring up um, context on this. Yeah. Because the C4, if we refer to it, it says like, you know, all contributions uh, must use the same license as the project. Uh, the project itself should use the copyright, like, uh, Bitcoin developers, Monero contributors, whatever. Right now for Maros, it's Luke, aka me, but I will change that before mainnet. It's something I'm still deciding the terminology I want to use on. Um, it basically says, you know, if you host your code on GitHub, you should also track issues on GitHub. You shouldn't have three different uh, platforms. And you especially shouldn't have open source code and then a private platform for tracking issues and so on. And it just talks really about how to organize code and so on. So there's a lot uh, to it, but it demonstrates how having really clear and established guidelines can not only help welcome people by letting them know how this operates, but it also comments on how it can resolve disputes. If one user says something looks okay and another user says, wait, why are you not doing a full poll request for this or asking about this feature beforehand? Yeah. So and you can say, just consult this contributing file, which is not exactly and this, it, um, this it gets this a point of reference. This so, yeah. whole discussion reminds me a little bit of um, what happened with Polkadot. I'm going to say it's Polkadot. When um, one a, a random developer was poking around in the code and he managed to lock up all of their pre-sale funds um, 
it turned out to be hundreds of I millions from locked up. I don't yeah. think I've heard about this actually. <laughs> you have to send me a link to this after the call. I have not heard of them about this. Yeah, he'd made he'd made some mistake and he'd locked um I think he'd locked their pre-sale money in the code and then he came onto GitHub and he said, Oh guys, by the way, um I think I just locked all your I know about this for the uh parody smart contract, the right, second yeah. wallet. Right. Yeah, yeah, no no no, the second wallet. That's right. Got, so this <laughs> obviously does not fall in the scope of contributions, uh, but it's an amazing story. The guy, uh, so the parody smart contracts were hacked because you could um, add someone, you could add anyone as a representative and from there blacklist everyone else and break in. And when they released the second uh, version of the smart contract wallet thing, uh, it did not have this issue. Instead, to save money, they all used the same library called SafeMath. And they said, okay, so why don't we just deploy safe math on Ethereum? So instead of everyone having to deploy this extra bit of code, they can just refer to it in an already deployed fashion. And that's actually not a bad move, I have to say. But when they deployed it, they made it they made it so anyone could declare themselves the owner. And the owner could delete the contract. Yes. So that means this one guy just popped in, called the ownership call, uh, and then called the story to quote unquote see what would happen, <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly all of the smart contracts wouldn't work because they were requiring code on the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, okay, so that's and that so was the, and all the funds were completely trapped for every single project using these smart contracts. So I guess that's and like, then he popped on Gitter and he's like, uh, "Hey guys, I think I messed up. Uh, I deleted the smart contracts." <laughs> And everyone was like, hello, Al. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a really um, short DevOps. message that he left. It was like, whoops, yeah. I, think I've, I think I've blown everything up. And, and he filed an issue of Parity. He didn't even file it under the... He didn't even file it under their contracts repo. He filed it under the Parity node itself. Because Parity, of course, has their own Ethereum node known as Parity. Um, and when he filed an issue under the Parity node, he said, um, anyone can delete your contract. I deleted your contract. And he just <laughs> linked <to> the GX. <laughs> Okay, so, so, so it's I like guess, DevOps 1999 or something. And so yes, he has for that reason. That's not something that guidelines will fix, but that's just something that, that I guess... But, he so, didn't approach the project at all. He was just randomly sending trip. Right, randomly. Okay. Like, there is, there is some level of intent here to see what happens. Um, <laughs> I, don't think he, I don't think he legitimately meant to destroy... Uh, millions of dollars i'm not trying to attack the guy but no he did he didn't mean to try to destroy the contract and yeah. did not think it through um right so when he did that um <laughs> yeah. he uh no he did, didn't consult with the project beforehand so okay. no that's not something that would help because even if contribution guidelines still exist you still have to present them and make them accessible which means yeah. you know linking to them in the readme if someone files an issue having an issue template available and so on Okay, uh, the the monetary policy call. Um, yeah, this was the the the, I guess the call that we had last last week. It was myself. Uh, I was just there as a as a host and to, to struggle with some maths. Uh, you was there and basically a lot of community members. Not all of the people who joined the discussion. Um, I want to ask you uh, to explain what was the the what was the monetary policy call um, about, and what were the goals for the call? What what was the what was what was the idea behind the call? Well, I don't know why you're asking me this. You're the one who set it up. Because I'm Seriously. interviewing you. It doesn't make sense to <laughs> interview myself. You're crazy. We are friends. We are <laughs> colleagues in this podcast. Come on, speak up, Kryptosi. Take some credit. You deserve yeah. it. Okay, all right. Well, I'll explain it then. Um, okay, so the the idea was uh, to come to some sort of agreement or to have some sort of community invo involvement with deciding how the emission curve would be structured. So how many uh, new Mero coins would be printed and at what rate they would be printed uh, moving into the future. And um, I had no idea about how these things were structured. Uh, I'm no economist. And what the reason why I guess I thought it would be a good idea to have the community uh, discuss about it was because I, I'm growing to realise that there's quite a lot of talent within the community, as obviously these podcasts are highly technical. I, I struggle to understand most of it, but people who watch it 
do understand a lot of it and a lot of them are in the discord now so i thought okay let's start um putting these minds to some to some use so i, I put the idea forward to you and you were like hey that's a great idea <laughs> off you go <laughs> do whatever you think is best so um i guess as as a partly as an experiment, I thought, okay, well, let's let's do this and let's see um, what we can what we can turn over. Um, I wasn't expecting to get as much sorted within that two hour period as we actually did get sorted. But um, what were your views on on the actual call and how did you um, how did you envision it going before it went and was completed and and how ha- how do you feel about the call afterwards you don't have to say it was great just because i'm here but obviously oh i did think it was great if you complain uh, i can <laughs> mute you very easily and uh bring in someone who looks like you to, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah good luck with that <laughs> it, it is very it takes a while to get a beard like this you know? uh, th- that's I what i was really worried about <laughs> uh, that's what was, for, the, for the people who are just listening um on spotify or itunes or whatever Kaiba still has this magnificent beard. So I was Thank you. when I said I could find someone that looked like him, I was thinking, okay, we could we could get Jack Black in or someone like that. But <laughs> Jack, is, Black and... <laughs> Jack Black. He, he does remind me of you, but the problem is he doesn't have the beard, so I don't uh, think he would quite No, he has a beard. Yeah, but it's not magnificent. It's Okay, okay, well, thank you for that. Yeah. His, his top hair is completely styled differently as well. I have like I have it going over my forehead and styled to the left. True. My life. Ah. So not to mention, I have a bit of a slimmer face and a different nose. Yeah, a different hair color. I think you, different eye color. I don't have his face memorized. I just remember the episode of him in Community, and I watched Community a few months ago. So it's one of those situations. <laughs> I, I do remember him well enough. It's one of those situations where we get to like season three or season four, and uh, you've become too much of a star to actually be in the show anymore. So we have to get someone in to play your character and. I guess oh he'll be free. But the call, how did you feel about the call? And um, <laughs> how do you feel? I really did think it was great. Uh, I was a bit nervous, but it was kind of just thrust upon me. Not used to other people stepping up like that, but it was great that you did, and I'm happy that you did. Um, and yeah, I wasn't sure how it went. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, a few people really started speaking up, and we kind of found our groove and how we handled discussions. You know, we established the order we wanted to talk things out in. Or, you know, I kind of stepped up and did that. Um, I'm not trying to take credit. I'm trying to say, like, it wasn't this perfectly democratic system. No, there was and there was intervention by you with establishing the call and moderating. And then I kind of uh, declared a few bullet points. Uh, but one of the people who really stepped up was uh, Rock'em Sock'em Jesus. Uh, and he really helped out with a lot of the economy considerations. And that's something I really appreciate from him. And he's the reason I'm most happy that we did the call the way we did, just because we got all his input. And we actually decided some parameters that I'm really happy with and I'm excited to implement. Yeah, Um, it was interesting during the call. For those of you who I will put the link to the call in the description. Um, I haven't put it in my notes, so I must remember that. Um, It was really interesting because not only was there Rock'em Sock'em, there was yourself and there was um, another quite vocal person during the call. uh, uh, Clash, um, Luke Clash or Clash Luke, I forget. I'm butchering his name, so I'm sorry. But um, uh, it's Clash Luke. Clash Luke. I and... mean, his name's Luke, but he used to be associated with the project called Clash. Uh, he used to be the China CEO that you refer to oh, right. on our podcast. Okay. Like, uh, and at one point, I reached out to him. I'm like, "Hey, we've been friends for years, because uh, I actually knew him from a few years ago as well." Um. I don't look, why is your name China CEO? Like, it, it's always interesting, to say the least, <laughs> to refer to you in public. Because I want to talk about technology. And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's this hash algorithm, and I have a friend who's worked with them. His name is <laughs> China CEO. <laughs> and I understand the joke. I don't want to stop him from the joke. I'm just like, yeah, like it, 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 it does affect you professionally. <laughs> and he's like, what, what do you think I should switch to? And I'm like, I, I, do whatever you enjoy. And he's like, oh, yeah, I would actually like going back to my original name. So he hasn't worked with Clash for years. In fact, um, after he left Clash, he started his own project, um, which didn't actually. It actually had a lot of interesting uh, work done on the theory of it. Yet I never got like a test net up or anything. It never got too far. Um, well, but yeah, no. Know. So he had that project, but he reverted just back to Clash Luke just because that's how we first met, and it's kind of how he likes to see himself, I guess. 
made his name for himself. Well, he ha had had some um, different differing views to yourself, and you mm -hmm. had some differing views even to Rock'em Sock'em Jesus, who had had some differing views to me, who had the, the differing views to Hort. So it it was quite good to get through it. The what do you <laughs> think were the 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 best parts? What do you think are are the best parts of the emission curve? Um, that we have eventually, or I say we, that you, or you, or, yeah, well, I, say, I can say we, that the, the no, Meros community, the yeah, the Meros community has, um, I guess, uh, um, arrived at. What do you think are the best features of this curve? And um, could you explain a little bit about how we got to that, those decisions? Right. So I really like to define it into uh, three different sections uh, or three different considerations. Yeah. The high block reward, which is what's going to effectively determine our supply. Uh, the low block reward, which will, um, <laughs> sorry, just running through my head. The low block reward, which will determine the inflation rate after, uh, the initial distribution has been done, because this is going to be the tail emission, which basically says, you know, after Maros has been running for two years, five years, 10 years, whatever length we ended up deciding on, and we did decide on a time period, uh, the Maros block reward will effectively just permanently become this and will never go lower um, I like Bitcoin, which will drop to zero. No, we're not going to do that. We have tail emission like uh, Monero, notably. Um, so that to controls the inflation rate. And then beyond that, we have the curve, which says how long it takes to get down there and so on. So for the high block reward, uh, I love this number because I think it's really good, but I hate it because it's not clean. It's 300. Like, it's a multiple of 100, but it's not, like, 100, it's not 500, it's 300. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I struggle with OCD already. So, um, <laughs> so we have this high block word of 300. Uh, and the main reason we consider that is, again, because of the supply. So with the numbers we're looking at, we're looking at a supply of roughly 42 million, I want to say. Yeah, 42 million or so. Like, 42.3 million uh, by the time we hit tail emission. So within one year, um, within one year, I think our supply is 14 million, 13 million, 13 or 14 million. Uh, I am going to guess 13. I don't have the number right in front of me, so I'm just doing a quick estimation. But my guess is it's going to be roughly 13 million. So one third of it is going to be distributed in the first year. Uh and the reason for that is really because of the first six months. It actually may be closer to 11 or 12. I will pull up the math later. It's not something you want to spend too much time so on right the now. The first six months, I guess, is where the initial uh, distribution is. Notably yeah. happens. Yeah. Because it starts with the high block reward of 300. And it's planned that roughly six months in, it's going to drop down to 90%. So we kind of have a plateau. You know, we have a... Wait one second. Um, let me... Pull back up to my camera and see which way my hand goes here. So if we go, like, yeah, so we have the plateau here, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it, like, slightly decreases down to roughly 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's for the six months, and then it starts to turn down before flattening out again. And that flattening out is going to be the tail emission. Um, I do not have, like, a lot of range for my hand here. No, but very that, disappointed. I can't draw that, up my curve. That does but, look a lot like the actual curve that you had drawn. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it, it yeah. goes flat a bit, then kind of, yep. Yeah. So it, it, it's flat and then a bit curvy and then flat again. Um, <laughs> it, it's called a negative sigmoid. Uh, we did actually post images of it, and I'm sure you can pull one up for the description here. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you should superimpose it, slap it everywhere, get some neon lights, stand here. Um, <laughs> where's that air horn sound effect? That's what we really need. We're an actual yeah. air horn, except I live in an apartment. Um, <laughs> so as we discussed, um, so right, so for the first six months, we have a kind of plateau where it only goes down to 90% of the high block reward. Um, and that's really to, it was twofold. Uh, one of the discussions we had was preventing whales. And we kind of said the first three months may want to have reduced distribution, actually. The problem with that is that for the first three months, that does damage economic incentive to buy the coin because the rate of emission will go up, therefore devaluing the existing coins at their uh, existing emission rate. So what we decided on was a plateau. You had also mentioned the about the, um, the, the DAO and how it would impact mm -hmm. the DAO if we had a, a lower initial... Because the f first five months of DAO rewards are based off the first month of actual activity. So there was a lot of considerations, and we decided to go with a six-month plateau. So yes, the first three months are higher than we 
kind of wanted, but we kind of needed to do that to ensure economic activity. Uh, and then the next three months uh, maintain that right. So as we get larger adoption, you know, it's not just uh, the pre-existing click who has all the coins. You know, we're not going to be 90% over the first month and then 10% for the rest. So I think we actually set a distribution period of roughly five years before we hit tail emission. Yeah. Yes, but, uh, five years. We have five years before we hit tail emission under the scheme, where the tail emission, aka the low block reward, is six, as in six coins. And I pulled up what percentage uh, inflation that is per year. One second, let me pull it up. Uh, I just one second. I I, I, I almost mention, it. As, as you're pulling that up, I'm just going to mention also. Um, that during the call, as we were discussing these things, um, I'm definitely going to link to the call. It's well worth uh, the listen. But during the call, it was um, it was the discussion about um, we had used Monero, I guess, as a base um, for the, the, yep. the type mm-hmm. of emission curve. And uh, Rock and Sock and Jesus, who it turns out is an economist <laughs> by trade, luckily yeah. enough, um, <laughs> was the one who explained the reason why we don't have to worry about fighting um, fighting against whales, which was something that I was really worried about, and so was uh, of some other community members, but you can actually just allow whales to, to exist, and when the whales leave, that's when you're seeing the distribution happen <laughs> um, pretty much organically, which um, I thought was uh, quite, <laughs> quite inspired, or quite insightful, sorry. So, um, yeah. so yeah, go ahead. I- it turns out I didn't actually write down this number. It was just used for discussions in the moment. But I'm pretty sure the uh, inflation we set uh, for the first year of tail, tail inflation was roughly 0.8% or something. It, it was a rather low amount. And that's 0.8%, 0.8% because it's a flat number. Again, it's six marrows per block for an entire year. But the next year, it's going to be less than that because there's now a larger total supply in existence. Um so after five years, it does hit a 0.8% inflation rate. We did uh, a lot of discussions, you know, about extending it to like 10 years, but there was also commentary on, you know, how long will the projects last? Uh, how do we ensure distribution in the moment? Because cryptocurrency is rapidly evolving. And as much as I would love to say Veros is going to be here within the next 20 years, I think there is going to be numerous hard forks, hopefully not much change to the economy, because changing any economic parameters can be devastating to markets just because it shows that you know, they're not set in stone, which is kind of the point of cryptocurrency. So as we want to fork it to evolve the tech and protocol, we do have to respect that it is a currency as well. Yep. Um, that was another dynamic but, for the conversation, wasn't it, mm-hmm. actually? We had we had said, um, or I, I had asked, what would be the, the dangers of changing things? And, and that, was, that was actually yep. your response. Yeah. So we did kind of say that with five years, we are going to achieve the needed distribution. You know, it, the cryptocurrency definitely gets out there and we're going to make a splash within those five years or struggle anyways. Yeah. So that wasn't too, something too concerned about. And it is a pretty slow decline. Because, uh, again, I said the first year went down to 90%. And then you can consider it on average going from 90 I think we've got some technical difficulties. Right, we're back. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, my internet cut off in my... Uh highly developed part of the world known as the United Kingdom, which is uh, comprised of... But you're not united with the United States? No, we're not united with the European <laughs> Union either. We're not united with the United States. Probably because you're smaller than most states. You would bring down the average. We don't want you. <laughs> and, and, and we kind of managed to organize decent internet in our homes. Uh, but um, but yeah, sorry. Let's let's try to let's try to get back on track, and I'll I'll see if I can keep my internet connection for a little bit longer. Um, we was talking about the emissions curve. And you had gotten to the part where you was explaining the decline and mirrors being around in 20 years' time. Uh, right. So because we're talking about mirrors being around in 20 years' time, we did want to really consider the length of it. Because as much as I want mirrors to be around in 20 years, if we're discussing the value of it, we really have to consider how cryptocurrency rapidly evolves and with the information age we live in and the widespread knowledge of crypto, if we're going to raise awareness and make the data splash, it is going to be within the next few years. So we're not concerned with the shorter time period of five years. 
even though that does sound pretty short for a currency to and it should give out most of its supply. Um, but I mean, if we look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself has already given out most of its supply uh, because there's over 11 million coins in existence because of how these curves work. Where, of course, Bitcoin did have things instead of curves. But uh, And then Ethereum. Ethereum just has totally messed up economics. I, I think over half of its supply was there on day one because of their... Oh, oh my God. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Well, um, another thing that I, I found quite interesting was um, uh, we discussed with Rock and Sock and Jesus was that as Meros will have a a static uh, block mm -hmm. reward during the mm -hmm. emission phase, that actual inflation will be trending towards zero. Now, there's quite a few other projects that have got this type of mm -hmm. um, continual inflation, and obviously, if you're adding six each time and the numbers get yep. bigger but you're only adding six then you're adding a smaller piece of mm -hmm. the overall circulating supply so yep. i guess that needs to be taken into mm -hmm. consideration and um i guess documented for for people so, to understand. so again monero is definitely gonna be the most notable project in this field so i think our inflation i didn't write down the number but i'm pretty sure it's 0 0.8 percent so if it's 0.8%, it might be like 0.7 or so. Um, that means that 0.8% for the first year, but for the second year, it's 0.8% out of 100.8%. Yeah. And as you say, it does get down when you normalize it, so on and so on. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to bring up is the high block reward of 300 and why that's important. Basically, if we look at the current market cap numbers, um, if we cut into the top 300, our price would be 250. Uh, top 200, it would be $5. Top 100, it would be $16. Uh, top 50, it would be 61 or so. Top 30, $100. <laughs> you can definitely see how there's a lot more projects than there is value in the space um, <laughs> based on how quickly those numbers start going up. Uh, but my point with this was simply that, um, well, I don't think 300 itself is a clean number. It's not a power of two. It's not 500. It's not 100. Um, the nice thing about it is it creates a it does create the idea of value. Um, if we look at the top 20 cryptocurrencies outside of stable coins, only four coins are less than uh, $5. Only four of them. And I think with the past week, with what happened to Dogecoin, that's a different scenario now. Um, not only because Dogecoin went up, but a couple of others went up to pass the $5 mark. But when you get to 80 out of 100, 12 of them do, over half of them. So you go from 20% of them having that property to over half of them having that property. And it does kind of show that lower cap coins do trend to be less than $5 or even lower. And I personally feel like that creates a perception just because humans kind of have a want to own valuable things. You know, if I told you, here's a Fabergé egg, here's a Fabergé egg and replica. Like, what would you pick, Cryptosy? I'd take the replica because I'm vegan. <sighs> Wait, you, okay, you realize that Fabergé eggs don't, aren't actually made of eggs, right? No, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure. No, 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 no. There is a thing where you use eggshells and wax, but I don't think Fabergé eggs use that process. Oh, I was just making a joke that Fabergé eggs aren't made of eggs. I don't believe it. No, 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 because there actually is a thing. I used to do it as a kid where you uh, <laughs> drain an egg with like a syringe and then from there coat it in wax and paint to create an art piece. It's interesting where you paint on an eggshell itself. Um, Toast aside... Like all this commentary aside, um, so that is something I was personally worried about. R Rock'em Sock'em Jesus said it didn't matter too much. Uh, but the other nice thing about hitting 100 within the top 30 is not only does it give the appearance of value, but it doesn't give the appearance of being unobtainable. Like if we look at Bitcoin, there's a lot of people reporting uh, they feel like they missed out on Bitcoin because it's 40000 And it's like, right, but you can still buy $100 of Bitcoin, and if Bitcoin doubles, your money still doubles. And people are saying they missed out not because of its growth potential, but because of the fixed price that they stare at when they go to buy it. Because even though they kind of realize, you know, they do realize that they could buy a fraction, they're just, they're put off by it. They feel like it's unaccessible to them. So $100 definitely is still up there. And if you say we become the top 10 cryptocurrency, it goes up even further, of course. Um, I mean, I think if we hit number two, where Ether was given its current price of 1300 and the fact that we would have roughly, um, after one year, we would have a... Uh, Tenth of the supply? Yeah, no, that definitely goes up. <laughs> um, but my point is... <laughs> my point was, is that it's still accessible to the point where if someone goes to buy a coffee, they can be like half a Maros and not 0.00034 Maros. Yeah. Which is 
nice to have when you discuss easily transacting with currency. Yeah, and we had discussed uh, using different names for moving the decimal point over and all those other kind of uh, little little hacks, I guess, little life hacks mm -hmm. to, to make things easier. But uh, the the emission curve that was decided on took those things into, a, into account and essentially essentially doesn't really need those hacks. Um, <laughs> And I guess we tried to find a very well-rounded solution based on right. a variety of our own opinions and the uh, and the commentary provided by our members, as well as established projects such as Bitcoin and Monero. Right, and also as I, as we considered it, um, it does trans translate to the rest of the world too. Because I was um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody had mentioned when you think about um, mm -hmm. Japanese money, they have. They have. Uh, they don't. That would have been me. Yeah. Is that, that you? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I, was, I, was like, oh, I, I brought up gold, stuff. silver, U.S. dollars, and yen. Yeah. yeah, and they would say, "Well, they're used to transacting in numbers that are that high." So I guess it's not so mm -hmm. much that it's uh, you go. Well, the thing is, is that one yen is worth roughly a cent. I remember looking up a year ago, and it was uh, 110 yen per dollar. Right now, it's 104. If anyone bought and invested in yen instead of cryptocurrency, bad move. Cryptocurrency still went way up. But if you're in fiat, like, apparently Yen is doing decent. <laughs> I only know because I imported a couple of things from Japan. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, I guess the 5% but difference or 10% difference. The comment was, difference. my commentary was, is that because each Yen is worth a single penny, if you go on a Japanese site to buy something, or if you live in Japan and go down the street, I'm talking as an American here, um, you don't see 100.5 Yen. You don't see, you know, 2.89 Yen. You just see 200, or you just see 300 yen, uh, 5,000 yen, five, you know, so on, so on. And that's also the only reason I know there is a price difference, is because I'm used to in my head uh, shifting it by 110. But now apparently it's closer to shift by 100. I mean, easier math, don't get me wrong. I was just surprised when I found that out. Yeah. Uh, but okay. yeah. Can I ask you, oh, uh, I'm just sorry, you're going to have to see if the dog's about to pull the box inside. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, Another but yeah, that did lead to the discussion about printing so many coins, you know, decimals just want to come up. Yeah. Right. Sorry. I just want to add that one last comment. Right. So another community question we got um, was about mining pools. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of, of the time. I know we've gone over, but I've still got a few more questions. If you could bear with me, uh, just cancel the rest of your Saturday. Let's I mean, I have this. always advocated for a podcast to be a minimum of two hours. Yeah. And I've always said half an hour. So we've met somewhere in the middle. Around, I mean, around I've historically hour. advocated for an hour, and now we're at an hour, so now I'm racing it to two hours. You know, give me an inch, I'll take the mile. <laughs> so, so mining pools, um, mining pools for mirrors. I guess they're they there's are they are they are they inevitable? Um, and will you be giving pointers and helping mining pools to grow? Um, how does that fit in with choosing an algorithm like random X? Uh, so with random, sorry, I just had to uh, text a member of my family. I know it's really bad timing of me, but um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so when it comes to random X, that actually isn't really related to the pool discussion. Um, CPU mining is great for decentralization, just because instead of requiring you buy hardware, you can use hardware you already have. And of course, when you're talking about CPU mining, you are still looking at gaming computers, workstations, and so on. It's not a one person, one vote perfect uh, system. It is still very much uh, putting the effort you, yeah. Uh, and you can still set up multiple computers no matter what system we work with here. Uh, so the discussion isn't about pools where one person buys five computers. It's about five people each getting together with one computer. Yeah. And the reason I personally dislike pools, well, the reason I dislike ASICs is, as I said, you have to buy dedicated hardware instead of using hardware you already have. But the reason I dislike pools is just because instead of five people each contributing to the network, uh, you have one pool contributing to the network, and it very drastically changes the centralization, decentralization. There is an argument to make for profit, as in if five people would never find a block, but together they would find a block. But that argument actually falls apart, because when you have five people would find a block together as a pool, um, one of those five will still find a block as individuals. So, of course, that arguably makes the other four not interested in mining, and create such a low odds for the fifth they may not mine, which is 
unfortunate. But with pools, you don't have five people who may never get a block. Uh, you have five people who may never get a block. And then you have three people who would probably get a block on their own and so on. You know, and it's those three people combining to one, not to mention the five, that creates very uh, concerning aspects for centralization and so on. So that's the reason I personally try to create pool resistance. And I successfully, or not successfully, uh, it's, it's complicated. And I did that. Um, mm -hmm. I did that by requiring you use a private key every time you mine a block. So when you use this private key, you have to say, um, yes, I have custody. You know, I am someone who, if I could, I could severely damage the system. And by damage the system, I mean for pools. You know, if a pool is going around with private keys, then someone's like, wait, I have your private key, which is for everyone. What could I do with this? Um, <laughs> and that was meant to be the pool resistant part. Um, and there were workarounds to that, such as having the pool still do every single signature operation, which would require them to do about 10% of all mining, which is still a significant number, uh, even though it's not a overtly impossible numbers so there already was that workaround um and that is that may become the primary workaround is just have the pool uh, have 10 percent of the computing power a friend of mine did submit me another proposed algorithm though uh and i'm a bit hesitant to talk about it too much uh just because i'm not sure if they sent it to me, because they did say if they build a pool, they weren't going to open source it. They did say they would close source it. So I'm trying to think, um, <laughs> I'm going to keep it private for his sake. Uh, I'll ask him if he minds if I publicize it to be clear. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I, 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 no, I don't want to betray my friend's trust, but it actually was a viable way. Not, it wasn't completely viable. It was extremely technical, not only on the implementation, but it did have a numerous amount of trade-offs. But the thing about it is despite having a numerous amount of trade-offs, is that the pool itself didn't have that 10% computing power requirement. So because of that, the method is arguably equally as good as the existing workaround. It's not something I'm too concerned about. Um, rather, the part I'm concerned about is the fact that someone will create a pool and they'll close source it. And as they close source it, they may, they if they're first, they'll be the only one on Maros with a pool and that could be damaging to the network because suddenly people who are deciding they don't want to solo mine, if they just want to set up a pool for whatever reason, they go to set up a pool and suddenly they have a pool <laughs> and now everyone's using a single pool. And that has centralization aspects that are concerning. Not because I don't trust my friend, of course, but just even if you trust them not to be malicious and try a double spend, but there's still concerns where if their server goes down for whatever reason, then you know suddenly the network has a lot of its voting quite go offline. So that is something I'm asked or right about. So I'm taking one of the two workarounds in existence, uh, one of them public and one of them I'm being fully happy to comment on, the other one basically being just as bad, uh, where you offload uh, runtime cost of having more servers to do the 10% mining into development cost. Um, right, so that's the part I'm concerned about, just the fact that someone's going to step up before someone does it at all. So I probably myself, will develop an open source, a proof of concept of one of the two methods at launch. Or I might have it ready at launch, but you know, wait up to open source it. Uh, not because I would run it myself, uh, just, but rather to uh, keep pools out of the limelight. Because I only really want one, so if someone else creates a pool and they close source it, they're not the only potential avenue to go through. Uh, and I could wait until someone else builds a pool and publish it, but it, but you know, there is, it is nice to have a buffer between one pool appearing at runtime and everyone else learning that they too could set up a pool and then figuring it out and so on. So, okay, I'll, I'll but no, I, I do plan to develop an open source solution also because it shows this algorithm, uh, in this mechanism has limitations and that's something we have to acknowledge. We can't just run away from it and say, oh no, you're cheating the system. Screw off. We're going to hard fork you out. No. <laughs> Because there are projects who hard fork people out like that. Uh, I have a friend, and he was involved in this one project. It was a proof of stake Bitcoin coin, and he did something known as stake grind, where you get way more stakes than you usually would, uh, especially crafting your staking to increase your odds for the next block uh, maliciously. <laughs> and they released a network upgrade, and they locked all his funds. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's he can just now no longer spend his funds because they yeah, decided to hard fork him out. 
So, so uh, no, that's obviously something we aren't going to do, and we're not going to run and hide from the problem. And having an open source proof of concept demonstrates the limitations with this and encourages us to develop new and better solutions. We won't have any of those at mainnet just because I don't have any in front of me. <laughs> um, I did briefly consider it, and I couldn't find one in front of me, but uh, it's something that it just needs a lot more time and is therefore not being put out for mainnet. Yeah, um, I, I really like that the, the the approach that you're taking is not to censor people from doing whatever they want with the network, but instead to just add um, competition for them if they do decide to try to add Thank groups. you. I think that's, um, that's admirable. I mean, it's kind of my ideology of Maros. You know, we're not stopping forks. We're allowing forks just because forks are going to happen no matter what. And if forks happen, we're going to prove that we're more worthy of attention just by continuing development. And if yeah. the people decide that this other coin is doing better, that they're doing better, and we will accept that. You know, I'm not going to say, oh, no, you have to use Maros because I did it. It's mine. No, uh, <laughs> no, seriously, if someone else is doing better, they're doing better. You should respect that. Yeah, yeah, well said. Well said. Okay. But um, I do want to cite my multiple years of contributions. <laughs> like, this isn't me saying I've done nothing. <laughs> right. I've just had a pop up say <laughs> your, your microphone appears to be noisy. So I'm going to have to close that. If you could stop yelling, that would be, uh, that'd be handy. Thank you. Wow. Yes, you're being told off. Right wow. Okay. You know that's saying your own microphone, right? No, no, it was yours. Mine's, mine's always super quiet. Bullshit. Your microphone appears to be noisy? I think it's a Kyber's microphone appears to be noisy. I'm not quite wow. sure. It's, the text was really small. but That happens whenever quiet. someone talks, though. <laughs> Will Meros have multi-sig wallets? Uh, interesting question. On a technical level, yes, we support it. Um, you can take outputs to three different keys and create a single transaction signature that spends all of them, and the network will accept it as valid. So that is not a concern of its own. Uh, as for uh, the other aspect, um, as for wallets implementing that functionality at launch, wait, I'm sorry. I thought of the technical definition of a multi-sig rather than what you were asking. I was thinking about just using multiple keys in a single transaction with a single signature. Um, no. But when you're talking about multi-sig, you're talking about um, a secure yeah. method of doing that where yeah. you don't have yeah. all keys at the same time. You mean three different parties only having one key each. Um, right, so we support that on the protocol level, uh, but the wallets we're creating will not support generating such uh, transactions. Okay. So yes, you can do it at the protocol level, but... Um, uh, the wallet is not going to ship with that functionality that will have to be added in at a later point in time. Is it something you're really worried about adding? Do you, do you think it's an important feature for cryptocurrency to have multi-sig wallets or is it? Um, uh, I think it is exist? valuable, but I think the way more important functionality is cold wallets and that is something we will support at launch. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, the question that everybody has been waiting for almost an hour and a half to hear. Um, when will the next testnet be launched? Uh, huh. I'm still not sure because I think the next test is going to be the final one, which means, you know, all of the protocol is going to be ready and on the table. So I don't have a good answer for that in front of me. Can I say when it's ready? Yeah. That, when yeah. it's ready, it really okay. qualifies. Ready. It qualifies because um, you could say tomorrow if you want and it's not ready and the test net mm -hmm. doesn't last and it's uh, pointless and you do it again. So when it's ready, is a, that's a valid answer. Um, Thank following you. Following on from that, seeing as the test net is ready and we have to do the test net before the main net, but if I don't ask you, people will say, well, why didn't he ask? Uh, when will the main net launch, Kyber? When it's ready, Cryptosy. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, um, I guess that's it. I've got, I'm going to put, I've got a few more questions, but I'm going to put them off until next month. Um, you sure? I, I have another few hours here. Um, shall, shall, I, <laughs> shall we do one more? Shall we do one more? Uh, what's the one more? I can hear the, I can hear the crowd baying. Well, anybody who's gotten this far in, 80 minutes in, 
Uh, first of all, congratulations. And just because you've made it this far, I'm just going to throw in another question. Um, it's about another issue. The issue is number... Hmm, okay, ah, right, this is interesting. Because there were two issues which I looked at, and I wasn't sure which one of the two to actually question you on. Um, the two issues are, one is issue number 284, and one is issue number 285. Now, I think what I've done here is not label these properly. So I'm going to pick one at random, <laughs> which is... Uh, Very uh, scientific. Which is number 284. Well, okay. Um, and I want to save the next one for next month. We'll do the next one next month. But this one's a little bonus one for the people who have made it this far. Please make sure you like and subscribe and share this video or podcast with all of your friends and just tell them... Um, this Meros people, they're building something that is um, actually a cryptocurrency. It's not one of these uh, new new age uh, DPOS. Um, I don't want to say centralized. I'm not going to start slating projects. I'm going to add that. I, I, I mean, centralized projects are horrible. You don't. You may not want to. I'm fine with it. <laughs> centralized projects are utter trash. They should not be considered cryptocurrency. Rizzle is an absolute joke, and I hope it's labeled as a security to prove a point. Um. <laughs> okay, let me remove that soapbox before you before you before you uh, before you set up camp there. I I mean, I did start spouting conspiracy theories. We will discuss that actually um, on the next podcast. We will actually discuss that, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll discuss the differences between uh, Meros's approach, where anybody can become a, a block creator and the approaches of these other projects which are throwing out these wild transactions per second numbers. Um, let's take Polkadot, for example, or even Matic um, on Ethereum. Uh, one that's gone, garnered a lot of buzz. I think I think their official website says a million transactions per second. Uh, I could be wrong about this. It's called Solana. It got yes. a lot of attention from a variety of groups. Yeah, yes, uh, Solana, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of projects are building on... on 50,000 transactions yeah. per second. And I have to say right now, just real quick, the reason it hits 50,000 transactions per second is because you have to go through a KYC process to be, actually become a node on the network. Mm -hmm. And you have to have four Titan GPUs as well as like a 64 like thread CPU. Like a, you have to have like, a, it's either 64 cores or 64 threads. Like it, they require every node to cost like $20,000. Yeah. They require like two SSDs, um, like PCIe SSDs, and then a few in SATA and RAID, and then hard drives. Like, they just have the most ridiculous node requirements. And if you take any cryptocurrency and say, hey, we're only going to have 10 nodes, we're going to verify they're good via KYC, and we're going to require $20,000 to be spent on it, basically creating mini server farms, you know, a lot of projects can get 50,000 transactions per second. A lot of them can. <laughs> well, this is the problem. And I guess this, these are the things that... Um, Unfortunately, we're discussing them 90 minutes into the podcast, which was highly technical. So everybody who's gotten this far probably already knows this. But this, um, I, I don't want, I'm going to start getting on my soapbox as well. And I don't want to. So let's move on. Um, the issue that you had labeled number 284. And um, this was one, I guess you pulled yourself out of your 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 emotional, angry state. And you'd um, maybe you'd, you'd forgiven CI at this point. Uh, difficulty votes shouldn't require 50 votes. Um, this, uh, yeah, this is actually labeled protocol, and mm -hmm. I guess it should be. Um, a big deal or not? You've actually commented, said it's not a meaningful optimization uh, and it's annoying to implement. Um, I'm going to assume that you've probably um, known about this for a while. But, uh, the, yeah. existing, the existing solution is. Right, okay. So, yeah, well, that leads us in nicely. If you could explain this issue to us and um, how you intend to fix it as it's, right. it's currently. So, so right now we have a max capacity of 52,000 merit, roughly. It, it, it isn't clean like that. It's, uh, it, I think it's like 52,640 merit. Um, and that means over the year we have that many blocks and each block rewards one merit, which is going to be used. And yep. That's how many uh, votes will exist. So one of the great things about our spam filter is it is adjustable. 
uh, the merit holders can get together and say, hey, we're experiencing some spam. You know, let's race the difficulty. So honest transactions, you know, they'll be able to put in the time and get through. But pre-computed garbage, it's going to get caught in these gears. So um, as part of changing the difficulty, uh, merit holders vote on it. And one of the requirements to vote was that they had 50 merit, as in they mined 50 blocks and then had a single vote in this difficulty filter. And that's an optimization just because it gets us from 50,000 votes uh, down to a uh, max of 1,000. But the algorithm itself is pretty cheap, and there's no real reason to have that, especially considered that you're not voting once per merit. You're voting for your entire, like, as an entire merit holder, which means if you have 50 merit, you're not publishing 50 votes, you're publishing one. So because of that, there's just not really value in it. So moving to a more democratic system where mining any merit gives you a say is really what we're looking at. Okay, that was super concise. So thank you. Right, I try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I hope I hope everybody's enjoyed this podcast. I've I've really enjoyed uh, making it. I hope I hope you've enjoyed it too, Kaya. But I've enjoyed it. Awesome. <laughs> um, we will be back next month, and we will we will discuss um, the differences between uh, these types of permissionless blockchains and the permissioned ones that we almost jumped on our soapboxes about. I think after these two and a half, almost, yeah, two and a half years of, of podcasts that you've been doing with me, I think I should allow <laughs> you a little time to just, just rant it out because um, it's, <laughs> well, it, even when I look at it, I, I kind of feel like this is, it's ridiculous because we've got projects like Maros, which are genuinely building and genuinely trying to increase the transactions per second in a realistic way. And then you've got a bunch of other guys just saying, OK, well, I'll tell you what, we'll do you a million transactions per second, but there's only seven nodes. So <laughs> what the hell? It's basically it's, it's, a, it's a game of mind. I remember this one person who tweeted they synced a Ripple node, a full Ripple node. Ripple only offered three public endpoints to grab the data from. They said it took like three years and it took 10 terabytes of space to sync a Ripple node. And it didn't even sync the full database because Ripple lost like the first 10,000 blocks of data. <laughs> like Ripple literally just deleted at one point and they didn't realize they didn't have any other copies. So they're just permanently lost <laughs> for all time now. Yeah, mm -hmm. decentralized, right? Okay, so... Um, yeah, I, yeah, we need to discuss those things. So what we'll do, we'll we'll have another podcast where we discuss those things and we discuss them at the beginning, so we can people who are maybe are not that technical can understand the differences between um, hype machines and genuine. Another question I wanted to ask you uh, just before we get off our um, our unofficial soapboxes was with a project uh, a project like a Solana, for example, can they? Can they blacklist a token that's um, that's um, I don't know in some way upsetting somebody else? So, for example, the same way we had this recent considering article. there's a limited amount of people actually validating transactions and running nodes, they would just have to reach out to them and thanks to. I'm pretty sure they have KYC on running nodes. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure you do have to get approved to run a node. So they do have this info available to contact node operators. Yeah. So just like Janet Yellen called. Robin Hood and told them, look, stop selling GameStop mm -hmm. shares. She can call Solana and so say, look, you need to shut down Crypto C coin because, you know, you still have yeah. something like that. Okay. You reach out to 70% of nodes, which would generally be a difficult challenge, except when you only have 20 nodes. And they will pay <laughs> that means just that means paying off 14 people, you know, just sending 14 emails. Um, well, you don't yeah. pay them, you, you threaten them. You just tell them, listen, guys, uh, do as we say. Oh, yeah. You, I, I, I wouldn't be... I mean, they might just be able to add another 20 notes. I, I don't... Oh, to be clear, I have no idea of their node statistics. I have no idea of the process of becoming a block producer. I'm pretty sure that block producers are equal with the requirement that you have to get approved by the Solana organization who also does KYC before approval. I could be wrong. That is what I've heard. I've not actually done too much research on becoming a node besides actually learning about the hardware requirements. If it turns out anyone can run a node as long as they pay the $20,000 for the hardware, uh, then I am completely wrong and I'm not trying to spread misinformation. But if they are in the KYC setup and there's a limited amount of nodes, then theoretically they could just, you know, add their own nodes to achieve majority there. Yeah, let's, let's, try, not to, let's try not to fund too much. We'll, we'll do that next month. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you so much. I'll, for your I'll time. make sure to research it and verify my claims. <laughs> yes, yeah, because then that's that's when you uh, deliver them the loudest. So, <laughs> so I look forward to that. Okay, well, thank you very, very much uh, to all the people who have watched and listened thus thus far. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties halfway through, but obviously I'm I'm living in the banana republic known as the United Kingdom, so it's a uh, it's, it, I guess it is what it is, and uh, we will we will be back next month. Um, if you are interested in Meros and you want to get involved, um, you can jump into the GitHub, even if you're not a developer, because I think that's a great idea. Kaiba will tell you it's not. Uh, hopefully <laughs> there will be um, some... I mean, you ones. reported on an issue by Pedro. He's not an active developer on GitHub. Yeah, well, there you go. Oh, there you yeah. go. So, so um, yeah, so it's it's a good place to look around. Um, also, and probably more importantly, um, join Discord. Um, and when we have more calls, join the calls. Just just um, don't be shy. Uh, come forward. Enjoy yourself. It's uh, it's quite laid back and relaxed. Um, there's not too many egos there. Yes. When um, we do have calls, though, they do generally end with me getting on a soapbox. Generally, they do. But the last call, the last. No, the economic call, um, that had me get on a soapbox about uh, video games, actually. Yes, it did. It that did. Had... I don't think that was a soapbox. I think you were just really excited. I, I don't, I uh, uh, no, no, no. Oh, I mean, I called out um, a recent oh, yeah. release of one of my favorite series. Yes, yeah. I called out one of the... I, I called out um, some of their recent work for not being uh, faithful to the originals. Yes, so. that was right. That was quite insightful, actually. That was quite insightful. It, it, I, I would call it a bit soapboxy. <laughs> I think it was okay. I, I would say passionate. I'd say passionate. Not I passionate. mean, I think that's when you get the soapbox out, when you're passionate about something. <laughs> yeah. I don't think soapbox means you're holier than thou. I think it means passionate. Yeah. yeah. So, um, thanks for listening to everybody. Kaiba, thank you again for giving up your time, for uh, thank you, the Crypto transparency C. going, uh, for being uh, generally honest, <laughs> um, even when you can't give an answer, for not giving a, to something to shut me up. And um, I will see you again um, or listen to you again next month. So everybody, please remember to like, subscribe, share. Um, let's try and get as many people involved with this uh, genuine cryptocurrency as possible and see where the, the road takes us. So, Kaiba, thank you very much. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you, Crypto. I've always had fun doing these and it means a lot. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye-bye.